Welcome back to The Ancient World, a podcast with discussions and presentations of Greek myth and philosophy, symbolic readings of the biblical stories, and the renewal and rebirth of the ancient treasures in the Florentine Renaissance. And today we have a special guest from Georgetown College in Kentucky, Dr. Dan Scheffler. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, happy to be here. Great to have you here. And uh, just a bit of your background. So you have a master's degree in both classics and philosophy from the University of Kentucky a PhD in philosophy from the same university and currently teaching ancient and medieval philosophy at Georgetown College in Kentucky. So first of all, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for having me. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. Mm, it's great. So I, I first read one of your articles on uh, traditionalism and the ancient treasures. And uh, there was a couple of things that stood out for me, which was, the, so I'm quoting, the, uh, the approach so how you can approach truth through bodies of wisdom that have been built up over ages and therefore have withstood the test of time. And then what matters is that some very old ideas have not only survived the test of time, but thrived over the course of ages. People who have received their wisdom and lived according to their counsels have gone some small way toward flourishing as beings in a world characterized by logos. So I thought it was a perfect starting point for a discussion about the two books we've been working on here on the podcast for the last few months, The Life of Moses and Dante's Paradise. And then first off, we're going to start with uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, The Life of Moses. So I just wanted to hear from you, like your thoughts on the book, your relationship to the book and your favorite parts. Yeah, um, let's see. I, I think I read this book first as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied under a wonderful professor, uh, David Bradshaw, who is an Eastern Orthodox Christian, and he actually ended up becoming my dissertation chair. And I believe he assigned this book uh, when I was a sophomore in philosophy of religion, uh, which I, I suppose it was ambitious to take a 500 level class as a, as a sophomore, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I sweated through it. <laughs> do, do you think um, it was early to read it at that time or because of your age? You know... You know, I don't know. Um, I found the book very approachable. And in a lot of ways, it's shaped my own philosophy, my own approach to spirituality, my approach to life. Um, so I'm actually rather grateful that it came into my life uh, at that early point. Yeah. I mean, I just discovered it last year and I was a bit shocked how accessible it is. <laughs> it's like a yeah. contemporary person. Yeah, and completely. opening the whole symbolic world. Uh, so, but how did it shape your spiritual your view of the spiritual? Well, I think the uh, the theme of ascent, uh, which I'm, I'm sure we can get into, uh, since it it clearly has to do with with Dante and his uh, ascent towards heaven, mm -hmm. uh, gives this sense of the spiritual life as a quest that you are. Uh, climbing up a mountain, that it it requires um, effort, it requires uh, work, uh, but there's also a continual sense of progress, that you're moving towards uh, something good, that mm -hmm. you're moving towards God himself um, in that climb up the mountain. Uh, I think that's a controlling metaphor in a lot of Western uh, thought, yeah. Uh, and it's a it's a powerful metaphor. You've got, uh, of course, going all the way back to Plato, uh, the Symposium, the Ladder of Love, yeah. um, but on into the late Middle Ages with Dante, with uh, people like Saint John of the Cross and the ascent of Mount Carmel. Um, you have this this ascent theme, yeah. um, and I think that that has it's influenced. It's also really inspiring, happens. though. It's like you can. It's embracing uh, education in some, some sense, like growth, learning more knowledge, uh, instead of this, just taking a, a leap <laughs> just, that you can right. actually, yeah, you start a journey and then you, then you grow with it. Yeah, there's a sense of progress. Yeah. Right. I think, I think sometimes uh, people in their spiritual life are looking to get zapped so to speak, you know, the, for, for something to click into place and all at once, everything's different. Mm. Yeah, um, and certainly true. I think sometimes people do undergo profound conversion type experiences, or uh, something happens all at once, and it's it's uh, a big deal. They are different, uh, but I think 
that's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, the typical way that things go is that you have to strive and that it, there's, there's a continual journey up mm. a mountain. Exactly. So how do, you, how do you think it's like an example of how it starts? Like if somebody wants to start a journey, they don't know where to go. What, if you look at Nissa, like how, like, do you have any thoughts about like samples of what the first step could be? I know it's a bit complicated question, but. Yes, he has this uh, passage. We can see if, if I can uh, find it. Um, where he, he talks about Moses washing up mm. on the, the shore and in, in the basket. Right. Uh, and uh, being picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. Um, and let's see. OK, this is on uh, this is in book one, uh, paragraph nine. Um, he says experience teaches us that the restless and heaving motion of life thrusts from itself those who do not totally submerge themselves in the deceits of human affairs. And it reckons as a useless burden those whose virtue is annoying. He who escapes from these things must imitate Moses and not spare his tears, even though he should be safe in the ark. For the tears are the unfailing guardian of those saved by virtue. So the phrase there that just sticks out to me is that the restlessness of worldly life thrusts from itself uh, those who are not completely submerged in it. So there's a sort of, there's an almost automatic or natural mechanism, uh, where just the chaos of a disorderly life, the chaos of a life of vice, yeah. um, has a way of, of, if you have any interest in yourself, uh, in pursuing virtue, uh, it has a way of, uh, causing a, a disgust reaction, hmm. um, that, that expels the person from it, right? And I'm sure we've all sort of, uh, maybe maybe not all of us, but I'm sure quite a few people have have had that experience where you're just almost ejected uh, from from the world of vice because it's so gross, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And th but then you have a challenge because you've been immersed in it, and so there has to be. Uh, he, he talks about tears. There has to be some sort of profound, deep, real repentance where uh, you you grieve over uh, the corruption that's at, that's already within you. Um, whereas if you're just apathetic and you uh, take it as a given, then it's it's hard to see how you're ever going to make progress up the mountain. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that was one of my first kind of astonishing <laughs> moments reading the book when he talks about the boards of the ark of the little Moses baby being mm -hmm. spiritual education that kind of shelters mm -hmm. you when you're thrown out into this chaos of of the water of of, of life and will kind mm -hmm. of glide you into the side I've never heard anyone say that like that that's what it means mm -hmm. <laughs> and how right. applicable it is now so again this, this mm -hmm. goes to kind of this approaching that book and looking at those old as you mentioned before, like the, like some people see them as fairy tales and kind of archaic stories from from so far away. It's just in, interesting, just because they are like <laughs> looking at another time. But then seeing that it's not the symbolic meaning is relevant now. It's the same mm -hmm. same situation for us now spiritually. That mm -hmm. was for me. That was one of the of the main things with the book, just opening up that whole world. Yeah, and I think there's, right after that, there's another element, which is the rejection of sort of worthless or, or worldviews that are in error, right? He, he uses yeah. the daughter of uh, Pharaoh as a sort of symbol for the uh, pagan wisdom, yeah. right, that, that doesn't have uh, anything to it. Um, and it's it's sort of he concedes that it's useful, yeah, um, for the time being in that sort of intro, mm. in the beginning of the journey, uh, but ultimately needs to be abandoned. I'm looking right here at paragraphs eleven and twelve, yeah, and I think that that is a a, a big challenge at the beginning of of this sort of spiritual journey is yeah. sort of sorting through 
what aspects of the world are just, or what aspects of my theory of the world are just uh, wishful thinking. Yeah. Things that uh, sound good or maybe uh, help me to avoid looking at the hard truths about myself or something like that. Hmm. Uh, and, and choosing to reject those and actually go find real wisdom, go find yeah. something that's, that's true. Uh, it's helpful with Gregory. I mean, he's, he's very, well, he's, he's kind of, he's uh, accepting, as you said, now the, the, there are things in all the pagan uh, religions as well that you can learn from. There are things in the profane philosophy that could be useful, but there right. is like, you can move further. <laughs> you can, you can study this, like you can go on this journey of Moses even, even further, and then you will get a deeper understanding. It's a, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, kind of a bold claim in some sense. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think, and it's it's very nuanced, you know. Mm. Um, people often talk about how Gregory and uh, the other Cappadocians, Gregory Nazianzen and and uh, Basil of Caesarea, um, are quote Christian Platonists, right? That they've adopted this this Platonism and just sort of baptized it, made it made it Christian. Um, and that's a that's a question that's near and dear to my heart because I find Plato very compelling. I I my dissertation was on Plato. I, I teach Plato all the time. Um, but I, I think that idea that it's just a, a sort of a thin veneer over essentially just Plato is doesn't capture the nuance that that all of all three of them uh, articulate in slightly different ways. Um, and even here in this passage, uh, Gregory. Has a has a pretty detailed approach where we preserve the aspects of prior thinkers that are true, mm -hmm. uh, that reflect the logos, um, that lead us to virtue, but we don't just uncritically accept everything in Plato or everything in Aristotle just because we're going to be, you know, Plato disciples. <laughs> and, okay. uh, you know, sometimes you go to conferences and 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 you see people who are just completely you know if plato says it i believe it you know <laughs> because they're just impressed <laughs> it makes me think of two things so you have in dante in uh, when he sees the giant eagle and you have the, the eye and the five stars on the brow you have two pagans among kind of the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the, the brilliant rulers and this is, for some people it's a bit of a like a mystery why is dante putting pagans in there but maybe he's <laughs> he's a bit of the same with, with um, gregory but he's acknowledging the, the value of it. Right, right. Yeah. But also not just uncritically saying, oh, wow, these guys were really smart and wise, so mm. we're going to just throw them exactly. into the, you know, the, set of all the saints, you know. The connected to, uh, it's a bit on the side, but like Philo, because uh, Gregory is referring a bit to Philo, the Jewish philosopher from what is 20 BC to 50 AD, mm -hmm. uh, which is, or in, do you think, so Philo, so is it maybe more, Plato based in his approach you think yes Philo is a is a very interesting transitional figure because he's writing in Alexandria yeah and uh, Alexandrian Judaism in the first century was a very interesting milieu where uh, you've got certainly devout Jews no question about that uh, you know steeped in the Old Testament and you know Philo is very steeped in the Old Testament, uh, definitely monotheists, not pagan Greeks by any stretch, uh, and yet also adopting uh, a number of different aspects of especially the Platonic, Neoplatonic, uh, although sometimes sometimes people might want to make a difference between Middle Platonic and Neoplatonic uh, mm -hmm. frameworks, especially in the metaphysics. This is the thing that I think... Um, needs to be we need to be careful about because when people say that platonism influenced philo or uh gregory here it's not it's not say the uh community of wives and children in the republic or uh philosopher king stuff in the republic or um you know his theory of uh you know other aspects of his ethics you know his stuff about friendship for instance um, what specifically what they're adopting is the metaphysical 
hmm. aspect, the, the aspect of, of Plato that has to do with the structure of reality and specifically keyed into um, participation, a metaphysics of participation, that we have different levels of reality, uh, that you have that which truly is the ta'anta, which um, for Plato is typically the forms, and then you have the things that come to be, the ta'anomena which are yeah. typically the material particulars that we see and, and interact with and can taste and hear and, and touch. Mm. And the idea is that that lower level is what it is through participation in the higher level. The taganomena are what they are mm. through some sort of mirroring or uh, having a share in, this is all uh, platonic language, in the ta'anta. Now, there's different ways of cashing that out, and the tradition gets very nuanced in how to explain all of that. But that basic structure is what gets especially brought into uh, uh, Philo's understanding. Uh, so he, he explains the symbols, the images in the Old Testament through that participation metaphysics. Yeah. He explains that, you know, uh, the rock is what it is through participation in something mm. higher. It's also it reminded me of this uh, the steps that you can you can actually do it with anybody like if you like the existence of other or the reality of other realms like if if you if you accept that numbers exist in themselves or the concept of a circle exists mm -hmm. I guess this is the, the Plato kind of uh, <laughs> the steps up to if you think that exists the mathematical realm exists as a reality in itself. Like this, like even if you remove the solar system, this, that reality is still there. Even if there's no humans thinking about it, it still exists. Then the next would be like the forms or the forces of history or or other abstract things that you mm -hmm. already have accepted that these are dimensions and and existing realities. And that that Philo felt a bit like this, but I also there's another thing last year where having the second look and reading through the biblical stories again, and then. You start, so you have Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2. So first, everything is created seven days. And then the second chapter starts with, and then we're resting on the seventh day, and then creating man out of the soil and breathing life into the nostrils. So like this double creation story. And I tried to ask many people last year about this, and I couldn't get a real answer. And I started reading Philo, the volume one, <laughs> first few chapters. Mm -hmm. And he lays it all out in his view that it is the, 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 the world of the forms, the abstract world, Kind of the, the blue pr blueprints in a, a spiritual sense are created first, then you create the material. So would that right. be very platonic in your view? Or? Yes, yes, that's that's exactly uh, platonic, and and we especially get in Philo um, the origins of what comes to be known as logos theology, okay. uh, which especially flourished in the early period of Christianity. You've got thinkers like Justin Martyr. Uh, Origen, and then uh, Athanasius, uh, but also finally the the Cappadocians that, that we're talking about, um, and this idea that that God's logos mm -hmm. is this eternal reality and contains within itself the blueprints for uh, all the things that come to be, so that the um, original meaning, structure, intelligibility of everything in our in our daily life down to a blade of grass or a tree outside or the meaning of our friendships mm. all has its origin in something eternal and that's a very profound thought that i think has shaped the western mind uh completely from philosophy all the way down to uh, literature uh, like Dante, although perhaps I shouldn't say down, <laughs> down to Dante, you know, like we're descending <laughs> to literature. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something, maybe, maybe we should talk about going up to uh, the beauty of, of poetry. Exactly, yeah. So, but when uh, there's two terms, I just maybe spend a few minutes on the, both logos and virtue, like in, in the sense that you're using it now, just for people listening, so they've got a much clearer <laughs> sense of it. If you, if you take the, the logos, just what you just said, like it's the intelligibility of, of the reality. That's what they call the logos. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because logos is a word that's been used, it's used so in so many different ways by by different people. 
Mm-hmm. Did you have any thoughts? Yes. About that? Well, it was it was used in a number of different ways by the Greeks themselves. It's part of the part of the problem. Uh, uh, logos it's, itself is a famously difficult to translate word, and it's it's a little bit challenging because. For, for many words, you know, we have, we have a word, the example I always use in class is set in English, S-E-T. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the Oxford English Dictionary has something like 53 different uh, definitions um, for the word set. But that's okay because it's context dependent. So the, a, a TV set means one thing, but to set something on a table, a verb means something very different, Right. And you're never going to get those two confused because they're they're just different meanings, same sound, right? right? They're pure homonyms. Whereas with logos, the reason it's difficult is because it has so many different meanings, but they're all sort of in play mm-hmm. all the time. And yes, based on context, we can select one translation or the other, um, but the other aspects of the meaning are always there in the background. So the core meaning of logos it's the original meaning is word a spoken word right Mm. but then words have meaning so it's not just the word that comes out of your mouth it's the meaning that's behind the word but then what's what is the meaning of a word it has to do with your thought with with what's going on in your mind so it's also the thought that you have when you speak Mm. the word but then, by extension, it's the very faculty that allows you to have thoughts in the first place. So th- your mind, right? Or rationality would be translations, right? Yeah. Well, so but we- then, yeah. sorry, le- the, the <laughs> last little bit there is that, but then when I'm thinking about something and then I'm naming it, I'm putting a word on it, it's because it has an objective structure and objective intellig- intelligibility outside of my mind, right? Mm-hmm. And so finally, the, the principle philosophical uh, meaning that uh, is in play is that logos is the objective intelligibility of things. And it's not just the word that I give it or the meaning that I have for it or the understanding that I have of it in my head, but what it has in itself. Um, mm. And so you can see that that chain, it all kind of makes sense. It's all, all connected. Um, but how are you going to translate that? Because <laughs> we, we don't have a concept that brings all of that together in mm. English. I've noticed that many, many Greek words have the same, like it's, or well, most languages, even Italian. And even if you can uh, even if you can translate the word in the culture it, with the people, the association, the meaning, the atmosphere, the emotional part of the concept doesn't exist in another language necessarily. So you you you, <laughs> you can't fully grasp it. But I just wonder, like I saw um, another explanation or uh, a commentary on words as this was about like s- symbolic interpretation that and the spiritual realm versus the material. So you can. Words are also portals and connections into the spiritual. It's like the word in itself is materialistically just like a, a bunch of lines together on the on the paper, but the effect it has on your mind is that it transports you into a spiritual world. <laughs> um, right? Would that correspond to any of the like? <laughs> yeah, this is always it? sort of a sticky point in the classes that I teach because we you know, we identify the role of, of language, the role of mm. concepts, um, of, of the thoughts that we have. And the students, I, I, I think because we live in this very postmodern age, you know, even when people don't know it, they have these postmodern um, inclinations. They are very quick to say, oh, that's just a word. You mm. know, that's, that's just a human concept. But the, the trick there is to see, well, yeah, but if we are going to be successful in communicating with each other at all, if we're going to be successful in navigating the objective world with our concepts at all, there's got to be some bridge between the concept or the word as it exists in my mind or in my mouth and the objective intelligible structure of reality. And so it's, it is good to acknowledge the insufficiency of human thought, uh, of human language, of the fact that 
in English, it, it, a certain word might have this deficiency, maybe in Greek, another word has this deficiency or something. But what, it, what is it beyond the language, beyond the concepts that we're trying to get at in our understanding of the world? And so that the word, just like a, a symbol um, in, in Gregory's uh, narrative of, of Moses here, it's a stepping stone. It's a, it's a window or a, or a launching pad. I like the Greek word afhorme, uh-huh. a starting point, something that gets you started on uh, that, that investigation into truth, into reality. Hmm. I just think about different words. This is a bit unsighting. I'm like, <clears throat> a chair is kind of one t- type of word that's somewhat limited. The word change Like the concept that cha- the word change connects to, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like you have billions of manifestations of that everywhere all the time of just change. Like the differences in words, some some of them are so powerful and deep, <laughs> as like conceptually. Um, but so back to the the Gregory book. Um, just wanted like other specific um, symbolic images from the life of Moses that you especially like or you find interesting or helpful or illuminating? Um, yeah, I think um, you mentioned it in your, in your email. Uh, I think the, the most impactful specific image for me is, is obviously Moses being hidden in the cleft of the rock yeah. when, when the presence of God passes by. There's so much going on in that <laughs> image. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned it, but that's, still the, the hardest one to to yeah to make sense of so <laughs> um yeah, talk right about- and and we see we see there i think um what's what's known as apophaticism mm-hmm. right this is is part of the important structure of the story of the, uh, no one can see god's face and live and he has this interesting dialectic where he says well how can how can uh life itself the source of all life cause death yeah. that that's crazy right so it's not that god kills people it's that the act of seeing god would necessarily falsify god it's because because seeing god would involve circumscribing god or treating god as a finite entity treating the infinite as though it were bounded and and finite and something perceptible so yes. the very act of seeing the infinite uh or wrapping your mind around it even seeing metaphorically as understanding yeah. falsifies god and therefore causes a kind of spiritual death and so we need some mechanism the the role of the rock is is where it gets very interesting yeah we need some If, if we're to have any experience of God at all, we need God, so to speak, to come our way and, and give some kind of mechanism for us to be hidden in the rock and have the back, see, be able to see the back parts of God uh, without circumscribing the infinite, right? Yeah. And he points out that the back parts of someone are precisely what you see when you're following them. Mm. Right. So by being hidden in that rock, that's our gateway into following after God, chasing after the good. And it's in that life of pursuit that we actually do come to have some sort of experience. So it's something that could enable us to try to to understand more of the transcendent and the mystery. Like it's a kind of protection mechanism. (laughs) It's both a protection of our uh finitude he says yeah and also a standing point yeah. uh, a solid standing point from which we can then begin the life of discipleship of mm. following after and uh, he mentions uh, a, a person trying to climb the mountain but they're they're climbing on sand mm. and they're never going to make any progress because they keep on slipping back down So we need to both be protected in in the cleft. He he likens that to the tabernacle or a uh, a uh, hiding place. Uh, Paul in in Colossians chapter three famously famously says that we're hidden inside of Christ 
in God, mm. <laughs> right? Um, but then it's also a standing point, mm. a, a place of solidity from which we can then begin that pursuit without slipping back down on the sl- sand. This is one sentence that, uh, so it's very often misquoted that if you see my face, you will die. People often say that, but uh, mm-hmm. Gregory says that it, it doesn't indicate that it causes death because the sentence is, uh, you cannot see my face for man cannot see me and live. Right. It's almost the same, but it doesn't say you die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Also, the name of that chapter is called Eternal Progress. And I really found that interesting because he talks about like the infinity, but it's also infinite like it's it's growing also progressively in, infinitely so so another way of like you can never <laughs> you can never reach that i mean you're in it you're a part of it but it's infinitely big and growing every all directions so you can never you can never get to anything else than just seeing the back of it <laughs> even if right right and and i think the idea is that if you had that desire fulfilled yeah. your desire for the beautiful which which put an asterisk there i i maybe we can come back to the similarity here he switches in these paragraphs exactly into mm-hmm. something very similar to plato's symposium it's it's i think interesting that he switches from talking about god to the beautiful yeah. but he says if we have that desire for beauty finally satisfied well then the only way that could happen for a finite being like us is if what we've grabbed onto is finite beauty and so we wouldn't actually have what it is that we've been in quest of all along. Uh, you you would have tricked yourself or found something else, right? Mm-hmm. So the very nature of the quest after the beautiful itself, it's, a, it's, it's the holy grail, right? Um, is a progressive quest that, that cannot be fulfilled. And yet we chase further and further into it. A part of this is this the, kind of the, the most brilliant philosophy where you, you and or theology, but you 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 talk about something, but you also refer to the brain's capacity or the soul's capacity of <laughs> of understanding. You do both at the same time, like you mm-hmm. you're playing with kind of what we are able to as with our brains and, and as humans to understand and how much you can go into the transcendent or the mysteries and then. Uh, even if you did try, well, you kind of st- you nesting it up a little bit, like you, <laughs> he's he's laying it out. Why, or like in some ways, this story is also a like incredibly deep poetic description of some of the limitations in us, maybe. Right, yeah. right. Uh, I also like some of the what do you call it? The one is a uh, Mount Sinai is like the the mountain of uh, divine knowledge. So it's like it's more about when he's yeah he's climbing. That's the uh, you, he, well, he also says like Moses is one of the few, like most people will not have the capability or the time to to really go through that whole quest of climbing up the mountain of the divine knowledge. So mm-hmm. you can even try, yeah, you can try it. Well, I think, I think, you know, not even the best of us get to quote the top precisely because of what we just talked about. There is, there is no top possible, you yeah. know, um, but I think even with the lowest capacities, there's this notion of participating in the good as far as we are able, right? Uh, ha- with, with our will, he's got a very interesting uh, discussion when he talks about, about Pharaoh rejecting the good. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a fairly sophisticated notion of the will. And so there's, regardless of our capacities, we can turn towards the good and say yes to goodness as far as we're able and thereby participate in virtue to the degree that's accessible to us right now where we are. Exactly. And then um, I just had, had two things on the list there about like concrete examples from the book. So uh, when you have the plagues and then you have all the firstborn Egyptians uh, dies and then all the Hebrew firstborn survives. Then uh, just for the listeners, like an example of, of, of understanding a way of reading and interpreting symbolically because that has nothing to do with Egyptians per se. It's about, uh, as Gregory describes it, the Egyptian firstborns are the roots of evil. So not because they are evil, but a symbolic of evil has to be cut off at its beginning because if not, it will grow and become bigger. So when you cut off the beginning, you cut off also everything that potentially had come after that. So that's, that's one of those little stories that 
had to change in my mind. Uh, and the other one is also the crossing of the Red Sea, that this is a major transition in your spiritual growth. One of the major cleansings that you leave all those soldiers of the Egyptian army behind you is uh, vices or it's, it's uh, forces of evil or negative things that you have to put behind you. And then it's, it's meant as this spiritual cleansing on, as a major step. If that makes sense? Right, right. Yeah, that, that moment of the Red Sea, I think, is is pretty important because um, that symbolizes baptism in the Christian life for Gregory, right? And so there's this um, double miracle that happens. Uh, in, in the narrative, right, it's significant that the splitting of the waters to allow the people to pass through, the people of Israel to pass through, is an act of God. It's not something that they could have done from themselves. And so it's a, it's a wonderful uh, symbol of grace that the, the people of Israel are able to be preserved through the waters and come out on the other side through an act of God. And yet, uh, there's a, the, the other side of the miracle is that the waters collapse on and, and close in on the uh, army of Pharaoh, which uh, is, symbolizes our passions uh, or the demonic uh, strongholds in our lives. And so both of those are grace, right? It's grace from God that we are able to pass through the waters of baptism and come out on the other side. And also a grace of God that in a way that we, you know, it's, it's the, the people of Israel couldn't have just fought a battle toe to toe with the trained army of, of Pharaoh in a similar way. It's not possible for us to just, you know, grit our teeth, do that moral struggle, try to climb the mountain and purify ourselves from the passions. We really need that supernatural act of grace to come in and uh, overcome Pharaoh's armies. Right? Yeah, exactly. I'm getting imagery here from the paradise now when you talk about this, because like it's so beautiful, some of the Dante scenes that he's making of, of the grace. Um, I'm just curious about, um, again, like the cleft and... Kind of the mountain climbing the mountain scene behind like where in a practical more practical sense like on the spiritual journey for yourself in your life like how like where is this in the process or does is that a does that make sense like is that is that something for like uh monks in a monastery after they've been there for 10 years or like is it <laughs> like where or I, th it... I think it's a little bit both um at the very beginning yeah. of of the the Christian life, uh -huh. but it also for monks in a monastery, you know, uh, the, the most advanced possible stage. Um, because I think the core of the the symbolism of, of the rock, although I was I was struck as I was looking back through this, um, you know, maybe you can maybe I just missed the the relevant you know paragraph. But when Gregory talks about the the fact that the rock is it's in the whole of the rock, he says. Although I think I think a lot of translations have cleft or like crag. Um, he he focuses on the way that we are hidden in in that, and that it's it, the rock becomes almost like a home or a tent. But uh, to me, the the symbol also suggests that the rock is split. The rock itself is not whole anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that the rock has broken open, and that's why we can, so to speak, fit inside it. And I think this points to Christ's uh, death, his, um, his life splitting open, his body broken for us, uh, that it's through the very death of God that we are able to enter into the life of God uh, because we can be hidden in that, in that suffering, uh, so to speak. So I think in that way, it's the very beginning of the of the Christian life because it's um, the entrance into or, or putting our faith in the work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Um, but it's also the pinnacle of, of the Christian life because it's, it's still there at the, at the summit. Yeah. It reminds me also of like how, how the rock is such a strong symbol all through all of the biblical stories also with the, was it the dream of, of Solomon, like the, this giant uh, statue in the, the different, like silver and gold and bronze, is it mm -hmm. uh, brass and, and clay? Uh, in and then, Daniel? In Daniel, yeah. And then, <clears throat> sorry. And then uh, 
the hand takes out, the grabs out from the from the a rock from from the end of the world. I don't remember this. Uh, yeah, a, a rock cut without human hands. Yes, I think is that what's described. Gosh, it's so cryptic. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, probably the, the ancient Hebrew one is even more more kind of enigmatic in its in its meaning. Um, yeah, I think the I think the significance there of of that description is that it has to be an act of God. It's yeah. it's the the rock cut without human hands. Um, What's been described before is all the work of the human empires that have exactly. made this this grand statue and exactly. human efforts have created this structure of that's glorious. But then there's this other rock that is cut by God Himself exactly. and not through human effort. And mm -hmm. it's that rock that destroys the uh, the empires of this world. There's something about those those images, the symbolism with, with just the, the materials and the rock. It's like it's um, it's so enduring. Like thousands of years later, it's just, it's so direct to us. I think because it's it's kind mm -hmm. of primitive in a sense, but therefore so much stronger. Um, okay, so but I thought now we can make a little transition to the to to Dante and how this fits into his um, his main work for the spiritual part with the paradise and then. Uh, so I mean, this is he wrote that in the early 1300s, so it's 900 years or so after Gregory. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what are your? Do you have any favorite parts of the Paradise and and the, and the concept of ascent and? Yeah. yeah. Now I have to I have to confess right at the beginning that um, I'm a great lover of Dante, but I'm not a literature scholar. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the earlier we go in the Middle Ages, the stronger I am. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so uh, if there's any medievalists out there and especially any uh, any scholars of, um, you know, m medieval Italian poetry, uh, forgive me if, there, if, if I have any inaccuracies here. Um, but favorite parts, I would say the the part where he drinks from uh, the river Lethe. Yeah. Uh, in the transition from the Purgatorio to the Paradiso, I, I find very interesting. Um, and of course, also at, towards the summit of of his ascent, the last canto, of course, is is uh, justifiably famous. I'm also attracted to the uh, the moment where he sees the summit. He has a sort of preview of the summit of his ascent reflected in the eye of Beatrice. Mm. Um, I think that's a potent symbol that maybe maybe we can dive, we could dive into any three of those. Yeah. Any um, any of so, those three. And <laughs> um, what, what would the eye of Beatrice, Beatrice mean in that, that context? Well, so I see I see Beatrice. I mean, I know that there's a lot of different ways that we can trans interpret Beatrice, but I see Beatrice as um, the beautiful, beloved other person that is finite, right? So it's someone who is not God uh, himself but is participating in God's beauty and virtue and goodness. And because of that, similar to the way we discussed this, the symbols uh, earlier on, it's a kind of stepping stone or, or a, a, an aforme, a starting point in that journey uh, to God because um, we find it a lot easier, especially at the beginning, to love this particular good person, this particular finite um, instance of beauty. It could even be a, a sunset or something. It's something right here and now that we can experience directly. And so when Dante has that moment where he looks at Beatrice's eye, Beatrice's eye is directed to the highest to the summit of the ascent, to, to yeah. God himself. And she is in love with God. And so her act of loving God and being directed there mm. reflects that in her finitude yeah. to Dante in a way that at, his, at that point in his ascent, he's capable of receiving and it pushes him on. Yeah. It's one of the strongest images, I think, when... Because, <clears throat> sorry, she is directing the focus. She's directing the focus of Dante and us as a reader to read really like, okay, now, <laughs> now we're looking at the, the, the final destination and where we're going. So, uh, 
it's uh there's also this continuous thing with with her eyes and then every time from so he's ascending like nine different spheres and then to the empyrean but then looking at her eyes is like the that's what transports him but it's also then the what expands his spiritual powers in a sense and his his, his spiritual knowledge uh so then this is the, one of the themes and everyone who listened to the last season knows this very well so it's a um that's how uh he just looks at it and then he realizes that he has come to another sphere which is a higher one and then you also have all the other th themes about there you find the souls who have a bigger capacity or capability of of absorbing the divine knowledge for example a bit like you said with the ascent but also like your, the capability so um, yeah. Right, right, and this this is a theme that actually goes all the way back to to Aristotle. Mm. You know, Aristotle comments that with natural light, when our eyes are exposed to too much light, it makes them worse. Right, we slowly yep. go blind if we stare at the sun. Mm. But he says that with uh, with the mind, with nous, when it's the opposite. That when we direct our mind towards a intelligible light that is too much for us, uh, it in the long run, although it might be painful, confusing, uh, disorienting at first, in the long run, it actually expands our capacity to to comprehend, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then this that that idea was picked up by a lot of the early church fathers. Um, obviously, it's here in Dante. It's wonderfully illustrated. Another fun fun place that might be um, more accessible to to many people is in C.S. Lewis's Voyage of the Dawn Treader, mm. as the uh, as the party journeys further and further uh, towards the sort of undying lands, the Aslan's country. Um, everything gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, right? Um, but but Lewis wonderfully describes how they don't mind. They uh, there's some they're aware they're conscious of the fact that it's brighter and mm. brighter every day but they have a greater and greater capacity to exactly. take in that light and it actually becomes more and more pleasurable as they go and so i think i think that's part of the part of the spiritual life and i i, I like the beatrice moment because there it kind of happens all at once it happens more in a flash which we talked about yeah. Uh, a little bit earlier that sometimes you do have these experiences where where all at once you have a revelation of truth that exceeds your current capacity perhaps to comprehend but in that moment of revelation that flash of insight it it actually ex expands your capacity to take in in more as yeah. you go forward mm, super interesting i mean well at one place he's um, i think it's seven or eight sphere he's suddenly looking down again and he sees the sun and suddenly he can look straight into the sun <laughs> because he's gone four levels further up but he right. also <clears throat> at one point he's he's staring straight into saint john which is uh, um, a symbol of love and he goes blind because he just it's too mm -hmm. intense for him to look directly into the force of love <laughs> it's too much right he hasn't gotten to that point yet exactly <laughs> it comes back again later and then he can do it so um yeah and it's, I mean, that's a wonderful little image to just say that St. John is brighter than the sun. Yep. Right? Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, so someone who's been perfected in love in a very real way is exactly. brighter than the, the physical light of the sun. Yeah. Now it also comes to mind, like, just the, the eyes of um, Virgin Mary is kind of the, <laughs> which is sitting on top of the, of the, the rose to the amphitheater of all the souls. She's like, mm -hmm. so and all the angelical things in her eyes are just looking up towards the, the source of the light. It's uh, right. It's so incredible that he just, he, he made it, like Dante made it. He wrote all the three books. He passed away just a few months after he finished the paradise. Uh, it's just it's such a gift to, right. to humanity that he managed to complete the whole thing. And, and just like, it's, it's to perfection, all of it. So it's, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's one of those where I think, you know, uh, sometimes it almost seems like people have a work to do yeah. and that they can't die before that work I is so. is completed. And then, you know, people say, oh, now I can die happy, you know, yeah. and almost joking. But I think there sometimes is some truth to that, yeah. <laughs> that Dante did what he had to do and then and then yep. his life was up, you know. Mm. 
Um, so when I was, uh, I heard the other day also about like Dante and just trying to summarize the whole thing with the Renaissance and, and then the, like the church fathers and, and, and the ancients, like that uh, you reached a point with Aquinas and Dante that they summarized all that was up to that point with philosophy and theology and summarized it both in, in, a, in a more like prose way with, with Aquinas and then the poetic way with Dante. And then after that, it's been hard to add something <laughs> to, to this world. And then, uh, so if you wanted to know more after Dante, you, you could go back to the church founders, for example, which is one mm-hmm. of the main uh, things we're going to be working on this, <laughs> this season on the podcast. Uh, but immediately we found lots of treasures with St. Clement, with St. Gregory, with Philo. Like, well, mm-hmm. here it is. Here is. Here's the link when you put the ancient Greek and the, and the biblical stories, like how they toil with this in the beginning, both as Romans or as Greeks or as Jewish people. And it's a, it's a super fascinating like feel to, to play around with or just explore. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I guess it's your field. It, also. <laughs> there, there's, yeah, there's treasure troves of yeah. wisdom and insight that if people would just read, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm constantly begging my, my friends and my students, just, mm. just open a book, you know, if you, if you just start it, there's there's stuff to be found yes uh, and it's so rich and there's one thing like i had a great conversation last year with a professor in philadelphia and he we talked about well i think first i mentioned that reading aristotle like it's a language in itself you have to learn what he means with the different words like you learn a language and then you gradually understand more and more what it means so that just opening up the, the complete work of of aristotle is is it could be impossible almost to, to really get what it means. And then the professor said, well, in some sense, the gospels are the same. The many kind of symbolic stories are languages. You have to learn the language before you can understand the deeper meaning of them. And, and that's a part of, like you said, pick up the books. So I'm really seeing this journey myself that the more you get the basics of it, the more sparkling and, and, and kind of <laughs> living and immediate all these stories become. Right. I think sometimes people are intimidated by that because they think, oh, so I've got to learn a new language before I can ever yeah. even and you know, unfortunately, get into Dante yes, or whatever. A, a little bit, yes. <laughs> or, it's, well, that's the thing is it's true, but you you can get started right away. You know, it's amazing how you can you can pick up Plato. I have I have freshman students yeah. read Plato every single semester. And it's amazing how someone with zero background Ha, can find amazing insights. They constantly, we have these very interesting conversations. I just had one uh, on Thursday about Plato's cave and I was blown away by the insights that the students were able to get. So yes, you're going to get, you're going to get a lot more. Yeah. You're going to come and you're going to get a lot more accurate is the other part of it. If you really want to do real scholarship, right? You, you've got to make sure that you're accurate. Exactly. Um, but it's amazing how much you can get right away if you just open the book and Dive well, I think in. this ties into almost where we started. Like it's a journey. Like it, and the journey can be great from the beginning, but it will grow. You will get more and more out of it, and that is a part of the whole process. But I also kind of sometimes think it's it's good to say it because you can, if you spend half a year maybe on Aristotle, it could be enough to start getting a lot more out of it. Like it, it really pays off, which is another theme in all the spiritual kind of kind of. Kind of seeds and, and kind of uh, you get many fall back and and uh, yeah it's, it's, it's a timeless right. mechanism but it's, it's it really pays off and just to get a reminder of that it's, and and the return on it is a lot bigger than what you put in right and and we live in a world right now where it's never been easier to take that journey to get started you know I, true, I remember even when I started grad school there were a ton of scholarly resources that I would have to go and request access from some library in Spain or whatever to have them scan a manuscript or something and send it over through interlibrary loan. But now yeah. just about anything is, is freely available online. Uh, you've got all these podcasts, you've got YouTube videos. It's never been easier to learn about any of this stuff. But do you think there will be a revival of kind of early church fathers, for example? You know, I don't. I don't know. I, I I go back and forth between being extremely optimistic about the future and extremely pessimistic, um, <laughs> because it seems like 
we're expanding our capacity to access church fathers. You know, I can I can pull up the Greek of of any church father uh, within minutes. You know. Um, but also that same technology is increasingly distracting us and, you know, uh, compelling us to watch more and more cat videos, you know, which is not True. completely a bad thing, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> I, but I, do, I have to say that I, the last few months I've been uh, ordering print books again from, from Amazon and just like turn right. off the, the internet, the computer, just sit, <laughs> sit in a nice place with a nice light and, and a cup of tea and read a book. Gosh, it's beautiful. And the ability of concentration is just a thousandfold compared to, to being connected. So Yeah, I'll, I'll show you right here. I just constructed this um, wonderful book stand. I don't know if wow. you can if yeah. you can see For this. those listening, with it's a, like, a, with it's a, like light. a music, uh, like a note stand for a musician with just the, the book open. Yeah, I, I mounted it to a, uh, to a monitor arm. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of hovers in the air right before my desk so that I can type and, uh, and read at the same time. The, the, there is something that you just, you can't get this, the depth of the, like you don't absorb the knowledge if you're looking at a screen in the same way. You just, right. the things that will be just cut out for you. I know that Plato, I think it was him who had the same objection to books <laughs> in the beginning because I said you have to walk and you have to focus your eyes at different distances while you're talking to properly absorb what someone is saying. Right, yeah, there's a famous critique of, of writing itself in yeah. the Phaedrus. Um, although I think, I think his, his critique there runs even a little bit deeper because the, the, the primary thing is that a book can't answer your questions um. in the Phaedrus. The book can't talk back to you so whereas when you're in a living dialogue. dialogue with a real person then you can present your objection and then the person can say no uh your objection i have an objection to your objection yeah. <laughs> you know that or i can clarify that misconception right now whereas oftentimes with books you read something and you walk away with an interpretation mm -hmm. and it could be 20 years before you learn that that's a misinterpretation because the book's true. never going to correct you you know maybe you never learn maybe you maybe you go to your deathbed Mm -hmm. thinking that True. this was what Plato was saying. And you, you never, you never know because Plato's never going to come and tell you that you misunderstood him. <laughs> I do have a, a, a hope, but I also think it's like, so the dialogue is having a revival with podcasting, with YouTubes. That is actually some, right. from the technologies that is spreading a lot. And I think it's good. It's back to the oral culture in more <laughs> in some sense. Right. And I think it's also opening up the opportunity for information to be spread, you know, not everybody can sit at a desk for four hours mm -hmm. in a day and really dive into Plato. Um, exactly. But, you know, last year I, I took a side job teaching at a private school um, an hour and a half away. And so twice a week I had a three hour commute and the podcasts were were huge for that. And I got through a good amount of audiobooks mm. and that kind of thing. And so I think that opens up. I, I, I know there's a lot of people out there that are, uh, you know, if you're a truck driver or, you know, you mow lawns or you do something where you're sitting on, on something and you can listen, uh, you can, you can actually have a, a far greater access to the kinds of information and thinking that used to be strictly limited to academics yeah. um, and was for a very small minority of the population. Mm, it's true. Yeah. And many of those people have very interesting insights from very different perspectives than, right. <laughs> than yeah, the more like academic circles. In the, it's true. Um, all right. So um, just trying to sum up uh, the last of the Dante, like, I was just thinking that before we started, so if there's some kind of Gregory and Dante connection, maybe it's, we've been through it now. Uh, in some sense, Dante would also kind of encompass everything before, I think. Uh, it's still just uh, one of the things I'm, I keep repeating is that symbolism takes a bit of time to understand, but you really get a lot out of it. And it's, a, it's something you can train up to think. So for some people, if they hear that Dante is just as an example, it's not necessarily about the afterlife. It's also about life now. So right. <laughs> if you behave like, like an idiot now, you, you go to hell now, spiritually. 
it's not about being dead, but it's about your, your spiritual life will, will be horrible. And you can also start a journey towards the paradise now as a human being <laughs> by, by trying to be a better person. So it's right. for some people, that's kind of the first time they've ever heard. So, yeah, yeah, completely, but completely yeah. agree. And then I think, I think if we were to bridge back to the beginning, um, is this whole theme of ascent. Yeah. Right. Uh, which I, and, and it's an it's, ascent that's yeah. based on desire in both a, authors. I think that's yes. a key element. And it's super beautiful. I think because it's about vitality and growth and uh, mm -hmm. positivity and progress and things actually get better. And they, <laughs> so it's so much encapsulated into, into the, the, the symbol of ascent. Uh, it's very bright and shining also, I think, as a <laughs> something to have in your life. Right, but, <laughs> right. Yeah, um, so much of that goes back to, uh, I think we already mentioned, the ladder of love in the yeah. symposium. Okay. Uh, you've got these yes, tell me about that. three three core elements uh, there that you see in all three of these works, the symposium, the life of Moses, and uh, the divine comedy, which is you've got an ascent. That ascent has a target. The target is the beautiful. Hmm. So why are we climbing up this ladder or this mountain or these spheres to get to the beautiful with a capital B? the eternal. It's because inside of us, we have this natural psych psychology of Eros, mm. which responds intrinsically to the beautiful. Um, and I think that that's a profound insight into uh, human psychology, that we have something in us that responds. Uh, and it, it drives us forward. It drives us to make that ascent uh or so in in gregory he he talks about the frog life mm -hmm. when it, he he goes through the the 10 uh plagues yeah and yep. he talks about the symbolism of the of the frogs and i, I just think it's hilarious that he talks about the frog life mm. uh and he, he says that the frog life would be a life where we didn't have that mm. where we didn't have that capacity to respond to the eternal where we just were beasts we just sort of did by instinct we we acted just according to our our basic nature and we stayed at that level but the thing that makes us something more than frogs <laughs> according to to gregory is this divine spark in us that's <laughs> pushing us forward it's driving us forward up the mountain um it's and I, I think that's a theme <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the frog life frog. and the divine life. <laughs> don't be, don't be frogs, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you could be, but there's something else that would be. <laughs> you can aspire to. Um, oh, but that was a really beautiful way of summing it up with, um, yeah, kind of striving towards the beautiful that it, that it is in us. Um, so I think we're just going to let that stand as the last word and just going to wrap up the awesome. episode there. Yeah. So I just want to say again, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a real, real pleasure. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. Yep. Great. So um, just then finally, as always, to everybody listening, thank you so much for, for tuning in today and uh, we'll see you again soon here on the Ancient World Podcast. <laughs>